The Battle of Cannae is one of the ancient world's most iconic encounters. It was, probably, the greatest battle of the longest and most costly war the central Mediterranean had ever seen. It was, by far, both Rome's worst defeat and her gravest hour during the dark days of the Hannibalic War. Hannibal Barker's shining moment of triumph, Cannae was a battle which would score his name into the annals of military history as one of humanity's greatest generals. Cannae may well be one of ancient history's most famous encounters. However, there is still much controversy surrounding the battle, its pretext, aftermath, and even the nature of the engagement itself. Let's examine the battle with a historian's eye, including the source traditions, formations, and battle mechanics, in order to, with the best possible accuracy, determine what actually happened. Strategic Context In 241, Rome defeated the Carthaginian Navy's last battle fleet at the Agates Islands, bringing the two combatants to terms. The peace terms which concluded the two-decade-long First Punic War were onerous, though not disastrous for Carthage. Much like the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, the Treaty of Lutatius left the underlying geopolitical tensions which drove the First Punic War unresolved, and generated nothing more than a 20-year ceasefire. Carthage agreed to pay over 3,000 talents of silver, about 90 tons, and evacuate Sicily. Carthage had had a continuous presence on the island, centred on the city of Lilibaeum, from around 600 BCE. The war had left Rome, traditionally a land power, master of the western Mediterranean sea lanes. Carthage, who had been the dominant western naval power for three centuries, was left both financially crippled and without a fleet. Relations between the two empires were reasonably stable in the immediate interbellum, with both militarily exhausted powers meeting their treaty commitments. However, relations substantially deteriorated when the Roman Senate, perhaps cynically, exploited a period of substantial Punic weakness to annex the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. Straining under the financial burden of the war and Roman indemnity payments, the Carthaginian administration was unable to pay its mercenary units, many of which made up the bulk of the Carthaginian army. In a desperate conflict called the Truceless War by Polybius, these mercenary forces revolted, posing an existential threat to the city and empire. The exploitation of this desperate situation by Rome would only further deepen the resentment of the Punic nobility. With Carthaginian power permanently ejected from Sicily, and the lucrative provinces of Corsica and Sardinia lost, Carthage looked to Spain. The Iberian Peninsula was the El Dorado of the ancient world. The area was so rich in silver deposits that traces of smelter pollution have been found in ice core data taken from the Greenland ice cap, dating to the High Roman Empire, which correlates with archaeological evidence of massive mining and smelting activity in the period. Iberia was a country which was inhabited by fearsome tribal groups. The Iberian tribesmen of the Turduli, Bastatani, and Edetani resided in the coastal areas. The Celtic tribes such as the Everasi dominated the central highlands, and marauding warbands of Lusitanians and Vetones flowed out of the upper Tajo Valley. In 237, under the leadership of Hamilcar Barca, the leading Punic general of the war with Rome and the Truceless War, Carthage invaded Spain. Aided by Hamilcar's inspired leadership and tactical flair, over a 10-year campaign, Carthage re-established a long-lost dominion over the Greek and Phoenician coastal cities. Additionally, he achieved alliances with all of the tribal groups of the coastal areas, defeating the Turdetani and Bastetani in pitched battles. By his death in 228, Carthage had established direct control over the southeast corner of the peninsula, and under the command of his son Hasdrubal, this dominion over the coastal areas would expand as far north as the Ebro River on the foothills of the Pyrenees. This river determined Rome and Carthage's respective spheres of influence, as agreed by treaty. Although technically an element of the Punic Empire, in many ways the Carthaginian holdings in Spain were closer to an independent Hellenistic kingdom, ruled by the Barsid family, Iberian tribal culture valued personal relationships, 
and many of the tribal leaders had strong personal links to Hamilcar and his sons. In Spain, the Bastard family had founded a power base, which would provide the funds and the manpower for a campaign which could be manned and supported without any aid from Carthage itself. As Carthage was consumed with affairs in Africa and Iberia, Rome's military attention was fixed in Gallia Cisalpina, where a two-decade conflict with the Gallic tribes of the Po Valley raged. The valley of the Po was rich and fertile, and had been settled by migrating Celtic tribes in the 5th century. One of these tribal armies, the Senones, sacked Rome in the late 390s, after the Battle of the Alia. In 223, Quintus Fabius Maximus, led a successful campaign against the Ligurians, a fearsome hill tribe of the western Apennines. In response to the Roman expansion in the area, a tribal coalition of the Boi, in Serbs, and a group of trans-alpine Gauls named the Gaeste was formed. This large tribal alliance posed a dire threat to Rome's northern frontier, with a massed army poised to invade Etruria. In 225, the Gallic alliance invaded Italy and a Roman Etruscan army was badly defeated at Aretium, just three days' march from Rome. Days later, the Gallic army was pinned between the two Roman consuls, Lucius Aemilius Papus and Caius Attilius Rufus, at Telamon. The Romans destroyed the Gallic host in a massive and bloody battle in southern Etruria, where the Roman consul, Rufus, fell leading the assault. Over the next three years, successive Roman armies campaigned in the Po, fighting numerous engagements with the Boi and in Serbs, including the Battle of Clastidium, where the famous Roman consul, Marcellus, killed the Gallic chieftain Viri Domaris in single combat. In 222, the Gauls capitulated, and several Latin colonies, fortified towns, were built in the region to enforce the uneasy peace. Events were moving quickly. In 221, the commander of the Punic Empire in Spain and Hamilcar's oldest son, Hasdrubal, was assassinated by a Celt, apparently the result of a personal insult. Command of the Punic army now fell to Hasdrubal's younger brother, Hannibal. The 26-year-old Hannibal had spent the last decade on campaign with his father and brother, and was already a seasoned officer and soldier. The army he inherited had been campaigning for over 10 years and was thus battle-hardened and experienced, comprised of near-professional soldiers and officers. Spurred by persistent Roman bellicosity and aggressive dis diplomacy, the young Hannibal decided that Carthage was now strong enough to renew the war with Rome, a conflict that must have seemed inevitable given the attitude of the Romans generally. In 219, he intervened on behalf of one of his Iberian allies in a dispute with the coastal city of Saguntum. Although far south of the Ebro, and thus within the Punic sphere of influence, Saguntum was a formal ally of Rome. Hannibal laid siege to the city, which only fell after eight months and several assaults, an operation which almost broke the Punic army. The Roman reaction was swift and predictable. The Senate declared war on Carthage. Operational Context and Pre-Battle Maneuvers The Senate's strategy in 218 was typically aggressive and logical. The two Roman consuls, Scipio and Longus, were each given Spain and Africa as their provinces, or theatres of operations. Each consul was given command of a typical consular army, composed of two legions of Roman citizens and two legions, or legion equivalents, of Italian allies, called Ale, numbering roughly 20,000 men and 2,000 cavalry. Scipio would use a Roman fleet to deploy to northern Iberia around the Greek city of Emporion, with the objective of confronting Hannibal in Spain and disrupting his power base there. Longus would deploy to Sicily to raise a powerful fleet with the objective of crossing to Africa at the earliest possible opportunity. Both would supplement their Italian forces with local auxiliaries where necessary. By the summer of 218, Scipio's operations were well developed. He had advanced as far as Massilia with the lead elements of his army when word reached the Romans that Hannibal was not in Spain but was already advancing up the Rhone Valley. Hannibal, rather than applying the reasonably passive strategy employed by Carthage in the First War, resolved on strategic offensive. His main strategic objective, as far as it can be understood given his actions, was the disruption and dissolution of the Roman alliance system. 
Less than half of central Italy was controlled by Roman citizens. The rest were either part of the Latin Confederacy or were bound to Rome in bilateral security agreements or treaties. If these allies could be wedged from alignment with Rome and a pro-Carthaginian counter-alliance could be established, Hannibal was sure he could conclude the war in Carthage's favour and leave Rome in a far diminished state. To meet this strategic objective, Hannibal decided on an extremely aggressive and audacious operational plan. He would advance overland to Italy, through the fierce Celtic tribes of southern Gaul, across the Alps, and enter the Po Valley, where he could be sure of the aid of the Inserbs and Boi. If he could inflict severe battlefield defeats on the Romans and devastate much of central and southern Italy, then there was a good possibility he could fracture the Italian confederacy. In April or May 218, Hannibal advanced from Carthago Nova, the Punic capital in Hispania, along the coastal road towards southern Gaul. Leaving an army of 40,000 in the province, his expeditionary force numbered some 50,000 infantry and 9,000 cavalry, in addition to 37 elephants. This army was constituted by his battle-hardened veteran formations. His advance along the coast towards the Rhone was rapid, though not uncontested, and a number of minor battles were fought with Celtic tribal armies. As Hannibal approached the Rhone, one of the major geographical obstacles which, he, which had to be overcome to gain access to Italy, word arrived of the presence of the Roman consul, Scipio, in the area. Rather than taking the direct route along the coast road through Liguria, the Punic army audaciously marched north, bypassing the Roman army and headed deep into central Gaul. After a limited attempt to give chase, Scipio decided to return to Gallia Cisalpina and confront Hannibal in the Po. After winning a battle with the Allobroges in the Upper Rhone, Hannibal advanced through, probably, the Great St. Bernard Pass towards Cisalpine Gaul. By now it was late in the year, and the pass was covered in ice and snowdrifts. Environmental casualties were heavy, including all but one of the elephants, and the advance was ambushed on several occasions by native mountain tribes. The six-month advance had imposed heavy attrition on Hannibal's forces. He reached the Po Valley with just 12,000 African infantry, 8,000 Iberian infantry, and 6,000 cavalry. However, in Gallia Cisalpina, the Carthaginian found vast stocks of high-quality manpower in the warriors of the Boi and in Serbs, tribes who had been in a bloody struggle with Rome just five years earlier. The fearsome Celtic infantry flocked to Hannibal's banner, doubling his strength in days. The Celts were physically imposing, brave, and tolerant of the cold. In a small skirmish at the River Ticinus, the Roman consul Scipio was badly wounded by the superior Punic cavalry only to be saved by his teenage son, Scipio Africanus. Chastened by his rough handling at the hands of the excellent Punic cavalry, Scipio decided to wait for his consular colleague, who was marching rapidly from Sicily with the core of his citizen forces. Given his colleague's wounds, when the two consuls were united, longest assumed command, and decided to advance across the river Trebia and bring the Carthaginian army to battle. In a hard-fought encounter, the Roman army assaulted Hannibal's forces, which were deployed on good defensive ground on the far bank of the, now ice-cold, River Trebia. The Roman heavy infantry fought well in the centre, routing Celtic units to their front, but the Roman wings were enveloped and crushed by Punic light infantry and cavalry. Most of the Roman army was destroyed or dispersed. After the defeat of the Roman consuls, all of Celtic Cisalpine Gaul entered the war on Hannibal's side, and the Roman forces retreated south of the Apennines as both armies went into winter quarters. In the spring of 217, Hannibal resumed his advance south. The two Roman consuls of 217, Flaminius and Servilius, each with a fresh consular army, encamped at Aretium and Arminium with the intent, intent of defending the two major north-south roads. Hannibal decided to advance through Etruria with the objective of devastating the country and bringing the Romans to battle. Flaminius is treated negatively by the sources, and Polybius describes him as a demagogue with no military experience, though this is doubtful given the cursus honorum. After being reinforced by his consular colleague's cavalry, Flaminius shadowed the Punic army on its advance south. As it passed by a narrow defile along Lake Trasimene, the Roman army was ambushed and pinned against the lake. In a bloody, day-long episode of mass slaughter, the 20,000-strong consular army was dismembered and destroyed. 
With the twin defeats of the Trebia and Lake Trasimene, the Senate was cowed. Clearly, neither Roman command nor its fighting men were a match for the brilliant Punic commander and his battle-hardened veterans. Roman legionaries of the Mid-Republic were citizen soldiers, generally middle-class farmers who were mobilized for specific campaigns. Though many would have served in the army before, at mobilization these units were likely to be of inferior quality to professional Punic mercenary forces. Additionally, Roman grand tactics and leadership were clearly not capable of dealing with Hannibal's tactical innovations. With the death of Flaminius at Trasimene, Rome's leading statesman, Quintus Fabius Maximus, was named dictator and given supreme command of all Roman forces. He pursued what would later become known as the Fabian strategy. Acknowledging the qualitative weakness of the Roman military, Fabius decided to deny Hannibal battle under all circumstances, while doing everything in his power to disrupt his foraging activities. This policy was successful in avoiding further disaster. However, it did not prevent Hannibal from leading a path of destruction through central and southern Italy, the land of Rome's allies. In the opening months of 216, a new pair of consuls were elected, Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro. In a clear rejection of the Fabian strategy, the Senate decided to mobilize colossal forces for the campaigning season of 216. Not including the numerous deployed formations in Etruria, Sicily and Sardinia, the Romans mobilized eight citizen legions for the consuls to command. Combined with the eight supporting Ale, this force numbered between 60,000 and 80,000 infantry and five to 7,000 cavalry. The consuls were given orders to bring Hannibal to battle and destroy his army. By this time, Hannibal had advanced as far south as Apulia and had taken the Roman supply base at Cannae, furnishing his army with substantial stocks of grain. It was here, in southern Italy, at the small town of Cannae, that the two consuls would march to their fate. Pre-battle controversy. Perhaps one of the most famous episodes of the Battle of Cannae, as it is widely understood, is the problems of coherence within the Roman command structure. Specifically, the simple fact that no single individual had undisputed and sole command over the Roman forces deployed at Cannae. Formed after the Roman Revolution and the tyrannical rule of the last Roman king, Tarquinius, the Roman constitution emphasized the division of political power between individuals. This was designed to ensure that no one man could command sufficient power to threaten the republican order and reimpose the monarchy. At the highest level, this division of authority was applied to the military as well. The supreme Roman magistrates, the consuls, always served in pairs of two, and their constitutional power was exactly equal. This meant that their imperium, or command authority, was equal as well. This posed no problems under normal circumstances, as each consul was given his own army to command. However, on the rare occasions where the consuls operated together, neither of them had, had a superior rank, which violates the unity of command principle inherent in all military organizations. The Roman solution to this problem was to rotate the command between the two consuls on a daily basis, with one consul commanding every second day. It is this problem of command disunity which the ancient narratives appeal to as the major cause of the catastrophic Roman defeat at Cannae. The two primary sources for the battle, Livy and Polybius, both describe the relationship between the two consuls as extremely toxic. The two men were, evidently, political rivals and had a deep personal mistrust for one another. Amilius is portrayed by the sources as an elder, wise and cautious commander. Indeed, Livy inserts a speech supposedly given to Emilius by the elder members of the Senate, which depicts Varro as nothing more than an inexperienced, impetuous demagogue, and goes so far as to call him a poor consul. During the days before the battle, both Polybius and Livy describe the two consuls as having a stark disagreement on how to proceed. According to these traditions, Varro was impatient and wanted to force a battle at the earliest opportunity. However, Emilius viewed the terrain around Cannae as a poor choice for an engagement, as it was both flat and treeless. In general, a field was ideal terrain for cavalry, 
an arm in which the Carthaginians had both qualitative and quantitative superiority. A compromise between the two men could not be reached, and thus Roman policy swung wildly from day to day, with Varro aggressively placing the camp close to the Punic army and skirmishing heavily, and Emilius remaining inactive. Ultimately, Varro decided to force a battle on one of his days of command, and could not be persuaded by Emilius to wait. Thus, the major sources squarely placed the blame for the Roman defeat on the shoulders of Varro, the populist demagogue, who would not listen to the advice of his older, wiser, senatorial colleague. However, we have substantial reason to be highly sceptical of this entire narrative of events. Indeed, arguably it should be rejected outright. There are three primary areas of weakness which make this narrative doubtful. The first is Polybius' personal relationship with the Emilii family. Polybius was the Greek tutor and close personal friend of the great Roman statesman and general Scipio Emilianus, and accompanied him on his campaigns at Numantia and Carthage. He wrote his history of the Hannibalic War about half a century after the events. Scipio Emilianus was the son of Lucius Aemilius Paulus Macedonicus, the conqueror of Macedonia. Macedonius was, in turn, the son of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, the consul at Cannae. Therefore, although Scipio Aemilianus was the adopted grandson of Scipio Africanus, this adoption did not sever his connections to the Milii, which makes Polybius' treatment of Aemilius, Scipio Aemilianus' grandfather, suspect. Firstly, Polybius' major source of information was the family stories of Scipio Emilianus and his immediate friends and family. These were likely to shift the blame for Rome's greatest defeat to the other consul, Varro. In Roman culture, the traits of the father, both good and bad, were viewed as heritable, and thus Emilius' descendants would have wanted to portray his actions in as positive a light as possible. Secondly, Polybius would have been highly motivated to protect the family reputation of his close friend and benefactor. Polybius is a foundational source for the Hannibalic War, precisely because of the access he had to Rome's political and military elite, and he was used as a source by later writers such as Livy, who wrote his work some 150 years after Polybius, during the reign of Augustus. The second major area of concern is the aristocratic bias of most of the ancient sources, including Polybius and Livy. Although there were no political parties in Rome, certainly none which would look familiar to a modern observer, there was a clear political distinction between individuals based on their socioeconomic power base. In simple terms, those who drew their political support from the aristocracy and senate were called optimates, and those who drew their power from the lower classes were called populares. Both Julius Caesar and Gaius Marius were populares politicians, and these popular figures were routinely derided as demagogues by their political opponents. Aemilius was a member of one of Rome's great senatorial families, the Aemilii, who held the status of patrician. They were a core member of the senatorial establishment. Varro, conversely, was a novice homo, or new man, which meant that no member of his family had ever held the consulship before. He was also clearly a populares politician, who championed the lower classes and criticised the leadership of the Senate. Polybius's close personal relationship with the Emilii has already been described, and Livy was a loyal supporter of Augustus, the Princeps Senatus, and the Augustan regime. Therefore, both are likely to be hostile to Varro on partisan political grounds. The third major area of concern is the pro-Roman stance of the sources. Both are clearly attempting to frame the defeat in terms which would shift the blame from the Senate and Roman command generally, and Varro was a truly convenient scapegoat. In addition to these three sources of bias within the ancient narratives, the justification they advance for placing the blame for the defeat on Varro is also weak. The major charge laid by Polybius and Livy is that Cannae was a bad position for a battle because it was fought on flat, open ground. Thus, they imply that, had Varro heeded the counsel of Emilius, the catastrophic outcome could have been avoided. However, in actual fact, 
the battlefield at Cannae provided the Romans with several key advantages. The first is how constrained it is. Much like the battlefield at Agincourt, both flanks of the field were anchored on impassable terrain features. To the north flows the river Orphidus, modern Orphanto, and to the south there is a row of steep hills upon which the township of Cannae sits. The battlefield itself runs along a northeast to southwest line, and the space between the Orphidus and the ridge is roughly two kilometres, or a mile and a half, wide. By selecting a field which was so firmly anchored on both flanks, Varro substantially constrained the Punic cavalry and light infantry, virtually eliminating the possibility of wide, enveloping manoeuvres, as employed at the Trebia. Additionally, the flat ground would aid in the deployment of the massive and unwieldy Roman army. But, perhaps more fundamentally, there is no reason to believe that Hannibal would have allowed the battle to be fought on rough terrain. In the ancient world, with both armies employing a marching camp, it was, in fact, quite difficult to force an enemy to commit to battle against their wishes. This is why Fabius was able to be successful in avoiding defeat whilst harassing Hannibal. After capturing the vast grain stocks at Cannae, which was a Roman logistics base, the Punic army was very well supplied. The Carthaginian was on Italian soil, and every day he remained there, the burden grew upon Rome's allies. There was, therefore, much more pressure on the Roman commanders to change the situation, and thus Hannibal had more opportunity to decline battle. Therefore, it is probably safe to conclude that the disagreement between the consuls was substantially overstated in the narratives. What we can be sure of, however, is that this did not have an appreciable impact on the outcome of the battle. A small anecdote may shed some light in this instance. When the battle was concluded, Varro was not charged with negligence, but in fact Livy claims that he was warmly welcomed back by the Senate as a loyal son of Rome. That is hardly a reception Varro should have expected had his actions been so contrary to both good advice and the Senate's orders. Formations If one takes a balanced and impartial view of the Roman dispositions, rather than seeming to be impetuous and incautious, Varro's plan for the battle appears both rational and completely in accordance with the direction he had been given by the Senate. The Roman army had a substantial advantage in heavy infantry, as high as two to one, and at the Trebia, the Roman legions were able to break the Punic centre. Thus, a rational plan of action would aim to limit Punic opportunities for envelopment on the flanks and maximise the Roman advantage in heavy infantry by allowing for concentration in the centre. Geographically, Cannae is actually a position which achieves both aims. In Varro's choice of the field, the formation he employed and the actions he took during the battle, his intentions can clearly be seen. To fight defensively in the geographically constrained flanks and smash the Punic centre with a massive heavy infantry assault. This is a plan which both minimised the Punic advantage in mobility, specifically cavalry and light infantry, and maximise the Roman advantage in heavy infantry. To achieve this plan on the small field of Cannae, the Romans had to substantially alter their large unit formation. Typically, a consular army would deploy with its two citizen legions in the centre, supported by the left and right ala on either side. The Roman small unit during this period was the Maniple, a company-sized formation comprised of 120 men. It was typical for a legion to deploy a 10 maniple front with a depth of three maniples, organized in the three lines. This heavy infantry formation would be supported by the cavalry on the flanks and light infantry, usually deployed in a loose skirmish order to the army's front. The typical frontage of a consular army was, roughly, two kilometers. Thus, to both physically fit an army four times the size and to maximize the impact of the heavy infantry assault in the center, Varro deployed his legions in far greater depth than was usual, alternating the legion and ala. This formation presented 16 attack columns, each of only two or three maniples wide. By arranging the formation in such depth, Varro and his staff greatly increased the force of the heavy infantry assault in the center. 
This was primarily achieved by facilitating the ability of the Romans to far more rapidly rotate the frontline men and units, with a far larger number of fresh individuals to throw into the battle. Heavy infantry combat was extremely taxing, both on men's physical ability and, and morale, and by having so many maniples arranged in column, the Romans would be able to keep a far higher tempo of attack, substantially increasing the impetus of their assault. Therefore, the Roman army, formation, and plan of operations, as executed by Varro, posed a nearly insurmountable challenge for the Punic commander. Given the constrained terrain, the excellent Roman heavy infantry, and the massive disparity in forces, it was nearly inevitable that the Romans would break Hannibal's centre. Indeed, there was actually very little he could do to stop it. For any army in history, be it the Russo-Austrian host at Austerlitz, the Wehrmacht during Operation Bagration, or the French army during the Battle of France, having your centre broken almost universally means defeat. By putting an army centre to flight, you not only attack their command and support elements, but you isolate the two wings, which usually precipitates a general rout. However, at the Trebia, the Carthaginian army survived having its centre broken. The discipline and morale of Hannibal's army was exceptional, as it had proven that it would not panic, even if it saw friendly units in full retreat. It was in confronting this nearly insurmountable grand tactical problem, the massive Roman steamroller that was almost sure to break his centre, that Hannibal's true military genius is revealed to history. Hannibal would allow his centre to be broken. Indeed, he would encourage it. And when the Romans achieved their aim and poured through the gap, he would trap them in a vice. There are actually two competing models of the formation used by Hannibal at Cannae. These originate from the two dominant source traditions which depict the battle, Livy and Polybius, both of which describe a different formation. The Livian tradition is, perhaps, the most widely understood. In Livy's description of the formation deployed by Hannibal, the Punic army is arrayed conventionally, with the heavy infantry units arranged in line and the cavalry massed on either flank. Hannibal divided his 12,000 African spearmen his best heavy infantry, and placed them on the flanks. He then formed his Iberian and Celtic infantry, alternating units by nationality, in a line between the Africans. It's unclear exactly how large Hannibal's army was at Cannae, though Livy states that 8,000 Iberians made it across the Alps. If we surmise perhaps an additional 10 to 15,000 Celts, that would bring the total heavy infantry arrayed between the Africans to roughly 20,000. The curiosity of the formation used by Hannibal, according to Livy, was the fact that its centre protruded a substantial distance between the Roman battle array. This gave the Punic line a convex shape. According to Livy, as the Romans attacked in the centre and the advanced units gave ground, the line eventually stretched and turned from a convex shape to a concave shape. It was this alteration of shape which enveloped the Romans, funneling them towards the centre. The other model of the formation is described by Polybius. Though there are many similarities in the Polybian description of Hannibal's deployment to Livy's, there is a key difference which substantially alters the mechanics of the battle. Polybius still describes the crescent-shaped heavy infantry formation, comprised of alternating small units of Celtic and Iberian heavy infantry, with the centre projecting out towards the Roman line. The difference comes from the Africans. Unlike Livy's description, in this model the Africans are deployed behind the heavy infantry line. Each half, roughly 6,000 men strong, formed a column on either flank. These columns probably stretched as far back as several hundred metres behind the line. In this model of the battle, the convex line retreated similarly to Livy's description, elastically bending towards the rear, forming a concave shape and funneling the Romans towards the centre. However, according to Polybius, the heavy infantry line eventually broke under the enormous pressure. As the Romans poured through the gap, they found themselves trapped between the two columns of Africans. The Polybian model is, undoubtedly, superior and the one we should accept. There are several reasons for coming to this conclusion. 
The first is, Polybius had a far greater understanding of military affairs. The son of the Achaean League's leading statesman and general, Polybius served as his nation's master of cavalry or second in command of the army. He was thus not only an experienced soldier, but an experienced commander. He also had first-hand experience of the Roman method of warfare at the side of Scipio Aemilianus. Livy, on the other hand, was a writer, teacher, and academic during the reign of Augustus. He was the tutor of the future emperor Claudius. Livy was not only writing two centuries after the events, he had no military experience at all. Thus, it is quite probable that the discrepancy between the two traditions comes from Livy's misunderstanding of his sources, including Polybius. But, over and above these general differences, Livy's description is both self-contradictory and is actually quite unlikely. Livy's model requires that the Punic centre held firm throughout the engagement. However, considering the fact that the Punic centre broke at the Trebia, a battle in which the Carthaginian army was deployed on a hilltop and facing half the numbers of Roman heavy infantry, this seems unlikely. But perhaps more damning is Livy's narrative of the battle, where he describes the Celtic infantry in the centre as a mob of fleeing, panic-stricken fugitives. Thus, we should conclude that the Punic centre did indeed break, and that such an eventuality had been a part of Hannibal's designs. Battle The morning of the 2nd of August, 216 BC, grew warm and light, a picturesque late summer day in southern Italy. The Roman army had deployed in two camps, a major camp to the north of the river, and a smaller fortification on the south bank of the Orphidus, securing the crossing. Before dawn, Varro gave the orders to muster the bulk of the army in the large camp, and at first light, the entire Roman army marched rapidly for the Orphidus, crossing behind the protection of the second entrenchment. Under the cover of 20,000 light infantry, velites or javelin men, Varro deployed his eight legions in a dense formation facing south. These were placed under the command of the consuls of 217, Marcus Attilius and Gnaeus Servilius. On the right wing, he massed the Roman cavalry under the command of Emilius, which was squeezed between the heavy infantry line and the river. On the left wing, under the command of Varro himself, were the more numerous Latin and allied cavalry, which had a little more room to manoeuvre along the hills. In front of this massive formation, the entire army's light infantry was deployed in a loose, deep skirmish order. Upon seeing Varro's aggressive manoeuvre, Hannibal sprang to action. Finally, the opportunity for the decisive encounter had arrived, an opportunity denied to him so successfully by Fabius Maximus. The Romans were ready to fight, and fight them he would. Under the cover of his Balearic slingers and Numidian cavalry, the Punic army advanced from their camp on the north bank of the Orphidus, crossing the river in two places. First, Hannibal deployed the army in a traditional formation, with half the Africans on either flank of the heavy infantry line, and the Spaniards and Celts intermixed in the centre. Then, again, under the cover of his light infantry screen, he advanced the centre of his heavy infantry line towards the Romans, giving the formation a crescent shape. Simultaneously, he elongated the formation of the Africans on either flank, deploying them into column. The Africans were now armed and armoured in captured Roman equipment taken from the bodies of dead legionaries on the fields of Trasimene and the Trebia. Roman chain mail armour and shields were excellent, and this greatly increased the combat effectiveness of the already formidable elite Africans. On the left flank, between the heavy infantry and the river, he deployed the Celtic and Iberian horse under Hasdrubal, probably numbering around 6,000. On the right, facing Varro and the Latin cavalry, he placed the legendary Numidian horse, numbering 4,000, under Mahabal. The heavy infantry line was commanded by Hannibal himself and his brother Margo. Unlike other encounters such as Ilippa, there was no extended pause between the deployment and engagement. As both armies deployed, the light infantry skirmished heavily between the heavy infantry formations, with slinger and javelin men hurling missiles in a vast morass of fluid combat. 
Plibius describes this skirmishing as inconclusive, with both sides giving a good account of themselves. However, the real battle was only about to begin. As the Roman heavy infantry steamroller slowly advanced like the incoming tide, the Punic horse exploded into action. On the Punic left along the river, the massed Celtic and Spanish cavalry smashed into the Roman horse under Emilius. The combat here was savage, as the extremely contained terrain prevented the typical give and take of cavalry combat, as the Romans could not retreat to regroup and re-engage as they normally would. Thus, the Romans stood their ground and fought a determined, stationary and protracted fight. Cavalry was not an arm in which the Romans had a great reputation, and had historically been a relative weakness in comparison to their heavy infantry. In contrast, Gallic heavy cavalry was highly regarded, and even was utilised with great success by Julius Caesar. Thus, in any encounter, one would expect an uneven contest, but on this occasion, the Romans were outnumbered as well. Considering these impediments, the Romans here fought valiantly, but eventually, and probably inevitably, they broke and fled the field, crossing the river where they could. Many of the Equites met their fate in the Orphidus, as thousands were cut down by the Celts. On the opposite flank, Varro, with the Latin and allied horse, faced a very different challenge. Here it seemed as though the rival formations were roughly equal in strength, and on this wing the Romans deployed their best cavalry. Thus, Varro probably had much higher hopes for success than on the Roman right. However, the Numidians did not fight like traditional cavalry. Master horsemen who rode bareback, the Numidians were lightly armoured and relied heavily on missiles. They were capable of extraordinary dexterity and rapid manoeuvre. As soon as they approached the Latin cavalry, they would discharge their javelins and explode in full retreat. Varro could simply not engage them and was rendered impotent, though his losses were light. However, after destroying the Roman horse, Hasdrubal rode around the rear of the Roman line and fell upon Varro, who was grappling with the Numidians. Now charged by the Celtic heavy cavalry and outnumbered more than two to one, Varro's Latin horse broke and fled the field, retreating to the town of Venusia. With the Roman cavalry now entirely absent from the field, the battle was decided by the clash of heavy infantry. The first contact occurred in the centre, when the leading Roman heavy infantry maniples smashed into the Celtic and Iberian heavy infantry, which was deployed forward. The Roman military specialised in massed heavy infantry combat, and its formation, panoply and armour were optimised around this kind of engagement. It is important to picture this type of fighting as discontinuous. Sword to shield combat would occur in short bursts as maniple advanced to make contact with enemy small units, with one side retreating a small distance under the pressure, only to re-engage a few moments later. This could make heavy infantry combat very protracted, sometimes lasting for hours. In the centre, the Gauls and Spaniards faced a nearly insurmountable challenge. With such depth, the Romans could rapidly rotate their front-line maniples, quickly exhausting the Punic units to their front and forcing them to retreat. Suffering from attrition and exhaustion, the Celts rapidly began to be driven back in the centre, ultimately retreating as far as the Africans. Eventually, after a valiant stand against the Roman tsunami, the Punic centre broke ranks and fled towards the rear. As the combat developed in the middle of the field and the Celts and Iberians began to give way, the Roman commanders continued to funnel reserve maniples towards the centre, concentrating the Roman infantry there. Finally, with the core of the Punic line in full retreat, the Romans were sure they had achieved victory. In fact, at that moment, it had appeared as though the battle was unfolding exactly to Varro's plan. They had held the enemy cavalry for long enough to smash the Punic centre and take the field. Thousands of Roman legionaries poured through the gap as dozens of maniples charged in pursuit. This concentration in the centre and the pursuit of the fleeing Celts and Iberians rapidly disorganised the already unwieldy Roman formation, which rapidly descended into a mob as legionary order dissolved and the maniples became confused. It was in this disorder that catastrophe lurked. 
Just as the Romans were concentrated in the centre, they were simultaneously attacked on both flanks by the fresh, well-armed and elite African infantry. The impact on the Roman formation was instantaneous. Reeling from the surprise of the sudden flank assault, the maniples on the wings re retreated instinctively, withdrawing towards the centre of the formation. Even after the centurions and tribunes were able to react and form an organised defence on the flanks, the ferocity of the Africans' assault forced the wings to retreat further. This prevented many of the reserve maniples from pursuing the Punic centre, which rallied upon the site of the Africans' charge. It was at this juncture in the battle that one of ancient warfare's most important battle mechanics appeared on the field of Cannae, compression. Ancient warfare was dominated by formation, and it was in the breakdown of formation during flight and the loss of the mutual support and protection it provided that most men were killed. Compressing a formation was an extremely dangerous situation for any ancient army. Each man required a minimum amount of space to use his weapons effectively, usually about one to two meters in width. As the formation became more and more compressed, men began to impede each other. But more critically, as the compression increased, individuals began to panic. The greatest cause of casualties in this kind of highly compressed formation was almost certainly crush-induced injuries, most often compressive asphyxia. In the modern world, we see this phenomenon in places like soccer riots or protests. We call them crowded deaths. The Roman steamroller was stopped in its tracks by the flank attack of the Africans, with its already dense formation badly compressed by the surprise envelopment. The exhausted Celts and Iberians rapidly regained their courage as the impetus of the assault in the, in the centre immediately dropped. In the Roman rear, the now uncontested Punic cavalry slaughtered any disordered individual who attempted to flee, forcing these units to seek the safety of their own infantry, compressing the formation further. The battle was decided, but the slaughter had only begun. At the battle face on all sides, the Romans were denied the space to use their weapons effectively. They were easily killed by the heavy blow of a Celtic longsword or the piercing thrust of an African spear. The Punic light infantry showered the legionaries with missiles, who could not flee or raise their shields in defence. As men fell, either tripped or hit with a sling stone, they were trampled under the boots of their comrades or smothered by the bodies of other fallen, to die of crush-induced asphyxia. Those who survived the crush were only to be killed when the Punic infantry advanced over them. It took all day for the Roman pocket to be crushed and slaughtered, and at sunset, the blood of some 60,000 Italian men drenched the fertile field of Cannae. Aftermath Hannibal had achieved his decisive victory. By an ingenious and novel use of formation, Hannibal had enveloped an army twice his size and annihilated it. More impressively, he had ambushed the Romans on a wide open field in plain sight of their commanders. After his great achievement, Hannibal rested his exhausted army. Mahabal, according to Livy, implored Hannibal to march on Rome, exclaiming that they would dine in the capital in five days. When Hannibal refused, Livy gives Mahabal one of history's great quotes. You know how to win a victory, Hannibal, but you do not know how to use it. We will never know whether Mahabal was correct although a balanced analysis should lead us to conclude that a march on Rome would have been unproductive. In the following days, as news of the battle reverberated around Italy like an earthquake, the Roman alliance began to fracture. Tarentum, one of the largest Greek cities in southern Italy, and only a recent ally of Rome, defected to Hannibal. Along with it went the entire coast of Magna Graecia, including the major cities of Croton and Locri. Further inland, most of Rome's past enemies, the Samnites, defected, as did the Alani, the Calatini, the Hirpini, a section of the Apulians, all the Brutii and Lucanians. But worst of all, Italy's second city and Rome's closest ally outside of the Latin League, Capua, abrogated its nearly two-century alliance with the Romans and opened its gates to Hannibal. Capua was a grave, heartbreaking betrayal as Rome had initiated the Samnite Wars, a 50-year conflict in Capua's defence. 
Hannibal had achieved his strategic aims. He was now in possession of a pro-Carthaginian counter-alliance, which encompassed practically all of southern Italy beyond Capua. However, and critically, the true heart of Roman power, the Latin confederacy in central Italy, remained rock solid. The Etruscans, after the deployment of a legion to Etruria, reaffirmed their loyalty, and the Umbrians, Sabines, Vestini, and the rest of the central Italian hill tribes never wavered. The Senate still commanded vast reserves of manpower, and now the outnumbered Hannibal was forced to defend all of southern Italy. Thus, the character of the war shifted irrevocably after Cannae, as Hannibal was forced onto the defensive, with the constant harassment and assault of his new allies by numerous Roman armies. But the ultimate destroyer of Carthaginian power arose from the field of Cannae like a phoenix, as the Roman survivors of the battle, somewhere between five and 10,000 men, trickled into the town of Canusium, they were led by the 19-year-old son of the consul of 218, Scipio Africanus. The tribune of the Second Legion had somehow survived the battle with just three other senior officers. This 19-year-old boy would rise to single-handedly destroy the Punic Empire in Spain and would become a Roman Hannibal. Destiny, it would seem conspired to bring Scipio and Hannibal to another battlefield over a decade later, this time in Africa, at Zama, an encounter which would decide the century-long Romano-Carthaginian contest once and for all. 